some of our solar system's planets have been visited by scientific probes less frequently than others. The outer gas giants, Uranus and Neptune, are so distant they're hard to reach. Uranus is 20 times further from the Sun than Earth, while Neptune is 30 times further. Both have only been seen at close range by NASA's Voyager 2 spacecraft. Mercury is so close to the Sun that any probe sent in its direction must take a circuitous path to offset the Sun's immense gravitational influence. The Mariner 10 probe flew past Mercury in 1973 and the Messenger probe went into orbit around Mercury in 2011. Venus presents different problems. Though it's our closest planetary neighbor and easier for spacecraft to reach, dense cloud hides its features and its surface has hellish conditions. The Russian Venera craft have landed, but in the hostile environment, they could only survive for minutes. Roughly twice every century, the planet Venus passes between the Earth and the Sun. Called the transit of Venus, it was closely observed in 1769. Astronomers realized that careful timing of Venus's passage across the face of the Sun would allow them to calculate the distance to the Sun, which in turn would unlock far more accurate methods of navigation. In 1961, the Soviet Union launched Venera 1, the first Venus probe. It passed Venus as intended, but Mission Control had lost contact with it. The following year, NASA launched Mariner 1 to Venus. A coding error led to control problems with the launcher. Destruct command. It was destroyed minutes after liftoff. Because convenient launch opportunities only occur in 18-month cycles, NASA had a second probe ready to launch. Mariner 2 was essentially a Ranger spacecraft designed to go to the moon. These were the early days of the space race, and the United States was desperate to catch up with the Soviet Union. Lead times were short, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory did not have time to complete its original design. In August 1962, Mariner 2 was launched. The Ranger spacecraft launched toward the moon had all failed. Mariner 2, on its way to Venus, was functioning, but its transmissions were weak, and due to a launch anomaly, it was off course. After a week, instructions for a complex course correction were transmitted to the spacecraft. About an hour later, Mariner executed the maneuver which involved a roll turn, followed by a pitch turn, and finally a main engine burn. It worked well, but several days later, the craft lost lock on the Sun and the Earth, its two attitude reference points. It corrected itself before ground control could diagnose the problem. Next, the signal strength increased to its normal level, but a short in a solar panel left it low on power. At this time, although both America and the Soviet Union had been sending probes toward the planets, nothing had succeeded. 
Mariner 2 lost several telemetry sensors and it began to overheat. It continued limping toward Venus, but some of the spacecraft's problems were solving themselves. Mariner 2 was now close enough to the Sun that it could function effectively on just one solar panel. It passed slightly less than 35,000 kilometers above Venus's cloud tops. It could detect no planetary magnetic field, and it recorded temperatures across the planet approaching 500 degrees Kelvin. Clearly, landing on the surface would present problems. But America wanted to focus on their first real success in space, finally doing something that the Soviets had not. Mariner 2 was the first successful interplanetary probe, and in California, the home of JPL, they celebrated. The next major advances in the exploration of Venus were made by the Soviet Union. The objective of the Venera series was to land on the surface of Venus. Designers understood that not only were the surface temperatures hot enough to melt lead, but that the atmospheric pressure was many times that of Earth. The landers they built looked more like diving bells than spacecraft. In June 1967, Venera 4 was launched. The vehicle consisted of a carrier craft with instruments used during the cruise phase to Venus and a spherical landing module that could communicate independently. After entry into the atmosphere, Venera 4's parachute opened. It sent back data for 93 minutes, but stopped 28 kilometers above the surface. Yet its electronics hadn't been overwhelmed by the heat. It had simply run out of power. Extrapolations from its final measurements showed a surface temperature of 500 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 75 atmospheres, far higher than anyone expected. The Venera program strengthened its landers and fitted smaller parachutes to reduce descent time. Launched in January 1969, Venera 5 and 6 learned more about the chemical makeup of the atmosphere, but neither remained functioning at the surface. The Venera series continued, refining the technology and making incremental improvements to mission duration, adding to the knowledge about Venus. In 1975, Venera 9 was launched. It was a new design, consisting of an orbiter-lander combination, with the orbiter able to act as a relay station for signals transmitted from the surface. Four months after launch, the orbiter and the lander, encased in a spherical shell, separated. It entered the atmosphere two days later, while the mother craft became the first probe to go into orbit around Venus, photographing parts of the surface in ultraviolet. The new lander had a ring shield that could replace a parachute during the latter stages of the descent through the dense atmosphere. Venera 9 transmitted the first black and white pictures from the surface, though a design fault meant a second camera could not eject its lens cap. Three days later, and 2,000 kilometers away, a twin craft, Venera 10, landed. It took pictures too, but the same design fault left a lens cap stuck in place. Both landers had been pre-cooled while still in space, and circulating cooling fluid kept the craft operating on the blistering surface for more than an hour. In 1983, Two more Venera craft arrived at Venus. Equipped with synthetic aperture radar, they made the first serious attempt to map the surface beneath the cloud layer. Over eight months, they mapped from the North Pole down to 30 degrees north. T minus 10. 
nine, eight, seven, six. NASA had taken a minor role in the early exploration of Venus. But in 1989, the space shuttle Atlantis lifted off carrying the Magellan probe. Magellan was bound for Venus. Like the Venera craft before it, Magellan would use radar to map the surface of the planet. It was the first interplanetary spacecraft launched from the space shuttle. Following a cruise of 15 months, Magellan arrived at Venus and entered an elliptical orbit. To keep costs down, the probe had been built from an agglomeration of spare parts left over from previous NASA missions. After some software problems, it began mapping. The images it relayed remain the highest resolution pictures we have of the surface of Venus. Pictures of low volcanic blisters emerged and lava channels were evidence of an extremely active surface. The thick atmosphere has prevented all but the largest meteors reaching Venusian ground and few impact craters were visible. Yet evidence of plate tectonics that sculpts the Earth's surface was not obvious. After mapping Venus, Magellan changed its orbit and plotted the planet's gravitational anomalies. On Venus, localized changes in gravity correspond to surface features. On Earth, this is not the case. A new naked picture of Venus emerged. The surface appears to have been completely remade around half a billion years ago. Yet while volcanoes and lava channels are common features on Venus, Magellan could not find evidence that volcanic activity still happens on the planet. In 2006, the European Space Agency's Venus Express went into orbit around Venus. Its focus was the long-term analysis of the planet's atmosphere. During its eight-year mission, it registered a sharp rise in the atmosphere's sulfur dioxide. This could be due to changes in wind patterns, but it could also be a sign of volcanic activity. Researchers also saw increases in infrared radiation coming from three different volcanic locations. More circumstantial evidence of current volcanic activity. Finally, the infrared team saw short-term temperature changes that fluctuated over just a few days. It appears that volcanoes may still be active on Venus. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. The mission ended in 2015 with a series of swoops into the upper atmosphere that verified unexpected ripples in the mesosphere. Very little in the way of Venus exploration has happened since Venus Express. Though elaborate plans exist for future missions to Venus, nothing at this stage has been funded. Yet many missions still pass close to Venus to use its gravitation to alter their flight paths. In 1974, Mariner 10 was the first spacecraft ever to use the gravitational slingshot effect on its way to Mercury. Italian mathematician Giuseppe Colombo devised the maneuver as a way to save fuel and to fly past Mercury not once, but several times. The technique is now commonplace. Ten days after launch, Mariner 10 executed instructions for a routine course correction. This appeared to go well. But after the burn, when the craft attempted to reorient itself, there was a problem. Mariner 10 knew where it was pointing because its tracking sensor could lock onto the star Canopus, 
but a flake of paint that had come from the spacecraft was confusing the system. An automated backup procedure found Canopus again, but flaking paint was an issue for the rest of the mission. To reach Mercury, a spacecraft must approach the Sun, and its immense gravity presents a problem. Voyages to outer planets are constantly slowed by solar gravity, but with the inner planets, a spacecraft constantly accelerates. Mariner 10 used Venus's gravity to reduce its speed, and it approached Mercury at an acute angle. Mariner 10 did not have enough fuel to go into orbit around Mercury, but its sun-centered path allowed the probe to make three close passes. Its first pass revealed a moon-like planet with a heavily cratered surface. Though Mercury is the smallest planet, it's the most dense. It has a large, iron-rich core. Prominent escarpments were seen. Here, Discovery Scarp cuts through two craters. It falls three kilometers. It's thought that these cliffs are the result of cooling and shrinking of the core. Mariner 10 continued to suffer technical problems. Its tape recorder kept sticking. There were restrictions in the rates of data transmission, and limited attitude control meant flight engineers were using solar pressure on the high gain antenna and solar panels to compensate. Yet the mission continued. Mariner 10 could only map about 45% of Mercury's surface as the same hemisphere faced the sun during each of its passes. Mariner 10 discovered a very thin atmosphere, primarily of helium. Several months after its third and final pass of Mercury, it ran out of fuel. It still orbits the sun. Main engine start, two, one, and zero. It was more than 30 years before the next mission to Mercury. In 2004, Messenger was launched. It was designed to go into orbit around Mercury, which presented a number of design constraints. It featured a large woven ceramic sun shield, but it did not have a dish antenna. It would rely on a phased array that could be electronically pointed. After a year in space, Messenger was back at Earth, using its gravitation to modify its orbit. Even though it was not a large spacecraft, it had a powerful engine for course corrections and orbit insertion. It continued on to pass Venus twice to lose speed as it drew closer to the Sun. Three and a half years after launch, Messenger approached Mercury, but this was not the end of its journey. The probe made two more passes of Mercury before finally going into orbit after almost seven years in space. Mission engineers had the extra problem of always requiring the probe's sun shield to be pointed toward the sun. Because it was in orbit, Messenger was able to complete the mapping started by Mariner 10. The planet's dominant feature is the Caloris Basin. It's an ancient crater more than 1,500 kilometers across. Mariner 10 saw some of the area but the rest had been in darkness. This map of the southern polar region uses color to represent illumination. Because Mercury's axis is not tilted, sunlight cannot penetrate deep craters near the poles. It was in these areas that Messenger discovered substantial amounts of water ice. Messenger received several mission extensions but in 2015, it crashed into Mercury after running out of fuel. A new mission is already on its way to Mercury, Bepi Colombo, named after the designer of Mariner 10's trajectory. It's a joint effort between JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, and the European Space Agency. It will take seven years to reach Mercury. The Voyager 2 spacecraft is the only probe to have made close approaches to the two outer ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. 
Launched in 1977 with its twin Voyager 1, it was able to take advantage of a rare alignment of the four outer planets, enabling it to make close observations of each one. In 1986, Voyager approached Uranus. In the distant past, it must have been hit by another massive body that knocked its axis sideways. Uranus has an east and a west pole, and for half its orbit, one side sees continual sun, while the other remains in darkness. It has rings which follow its north-south equator. Voyager 2 discovered 11 new moons and a misaligned magnetic field. Images that the Voyager captured showed Uranus as a bland, featureless planet. But this was because of its particular season. With images from the Hubble Space Telescope, we now know that at certain times clouds and planetary weather appear in the atmosphere. Uranus's largest moon, Miranda, was observed in detail for the first time. So chaotic is its surface that researchers thought that it must have been blown apart by some cosmic impact, with the fragments reforming. Now it's thought that tectonic forces, initiated by the gravitation of Uranus, are responsible for the Moon's jumbled appearance. As Voyager 2 left Uranus, Backlighting from the sun revealed two new rings encircling the planet. The spacecraft was now heading toward Neptune, the solar system's last planet. In the three years it would take to get there, ground engineers began preparing for unique challenges. Oh, the, uh... Neptune is 30 times further from the sun than the Earth and the light intensity is one thousandth what it is here. For photography, time exposures would be necessary, yet Voyager 2 was traveling so fast that images would smear without special preparation. Engineers calculated just how much the craft would have to swivel while exposures were made to compensate for the probe's movement. In June 1989, Voyager 2 began returning distant images of Neptune. Across the world, people had realized that the data sent back to Earth by this spacecraft was transforming our understanding of the solar system. This was before the Internet age. Researchers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory clustered around TV sets to watch as data and images came in line by line. Neptune is a more conventional planet than Uranus. Its axial tilt is 30 degrees, and it revolves in the same direction as Earth. While Neptune is slightly heavier than its fellow ice giant Uranus, it has a slightly smaller diameter. And, though it is further from the Sun than its neighbor, Neptune emits more heat than Uranus. The planet has an internal heat source that drives more dynamic weather patterns. Voyager 2 measured wind speeds at Neptune in excess of 2,000 km per hour, the fastest in the solar system. There were cirrus clouds in the atmosphere, and the probe recorded pictures of a great dark spot, similar to Jupiter's great red spot. It was an anticyclone in the southern hemisphere as large as the Earth. In 1994, when Hubble tried to find the same feature, it had disappeared, but a new dark spot was forming in the northern hemisphere. Voyager 2's last observations within the solar system were of Neptune's largest moon, Triton. Unlike all other moons in the solar system, Triton has a retrograde orbit, indicating that it was not formed at the same time as the planet, but that it had been captured. As Voyager 2 moved beyond the planets, its cameras would switch off to save power. Both voyagers continue away from the solar system, measuring the influence of the solar wind. 
This remains the only mission to the ice giants. On January the 19th, 2006, an Atlas V was launched. It was a very powerful rocket with an unusually small payload. New Horizons left Earth orbit faster than any other probe. It was headed for the Kuiper belt at the outer edge of the solar system, in particular Pluto. In a little more than a year, New Horizons reached Jupiter, where it received a gravitational assist that cut three years from its flight time to Pluto. After it passed Jupiter, the spacecraft went into hibernation, simply sending an all's well transmission once a week. It took New Horizons more than nine years to reach Pluto. Since it had departed, Pluto had lost its status as a planet. With the discovery of more objects of similar size in the Kuiper belt, it was decided that to be a planet, a body had to clear its orbit. Pluto's features surprised everyone. Here was a living planet, shaped by tectonic forces, but instead of rock, the mountains were made of ice and frozen methane. And Pluto has a thin atmosphere, mainly of nitrogen. The probe continued on over Charon, Pluto's largest moon. Its icy surface has deep canyons, and some evidence suggests that it has ice volcanoes. Charon is about half the size of Pluto, and the two orbit each other. From Pluto, Charon would appear motionless in the sky. As the New Horizons probe sped away from Pluto into deep space, it began the slow process of transmitting its recorded data back to the Earth. At these distances, it takes signals four and a half hours to reach Earth, with data coming in at one kilobit per second. It took 469 days for all the Pluto information to be received back on Earth. Early in 2019, New Horizons passed trans-Neptunian object Ultima Thule. And, with a mission extension, it continues exploring the outer reaches of the solar system. Our Sun is a star like billions of others throughout the universe. It's a giant nuclear furnace at the center of our planetary system. And although life on Earth is completely reliant upon the Sun, we also need our planet's magnetic field and atmosphere to protect us from extremes of solar radiation. Regularly, the Sun ejects huge blasts of solar plasma, and on Earth, a direct hit by a coronal mass ejection will play havoc with power grids, communications, and satellites. Eighteen fifty nine was a year of extreme solar activity. During September of that year, astronomer Richard Carrington was sketching sunspots when he observed an intensely bright event. Less than eighteen hours later, auroras were seen around the world. They extended to low latitudes where the phenomenon is rarely seen. Telegraph operators across Europe and North America reported malfunctions including electric shocks and sparking wires. This was the first time that solar storms had been linked with auroras and electrical and magnetic disturbances here on Earth, and it became known as the Carrington Effect. Since the 1700s, a periodic fluctuation had been observed in the number of sunspots, 
But a deeper insight into the sun's behavior would not emerge until 1958. James Van Allen was the chief scientist for America's first satellite, Explorer 1. It was equipped with a cosmic ray detector. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Bye, commanding command. The launch was successful, but the orbit achieved was highly elliptical with an apogee far greater than expected. As its altitude changed, Variation in the detector's readings suggested that charged particles were trapped in bands around the Earth. These became known as the Van Allen belts. It was a discovery with far-reaching implications. The energetic charged particles that make up the Van Allen belts emanate from the Sun and are trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. They fluctuate with solar activity and they present a risk to spacecraft that have to pass through them. The previous year, physicist Eugene Parker, working at the University of Chicago, had predicted that a constant stream of charged particles would flow from the Sun. He called it the solar wind. The astronomical community was reluctant to accept this idea. Soon his theory was vindicated, as early Russian and American spacecraft began detecting a constant stream of charged particles. Solar wind explained why a comet's tail always points away from the sun. Parker's supersonic solar wind theory predicted a variable stream of plasma, charged particles, permeating the solar system. The Earth's magnetic field deflects most of the solar wind, preserving the Earth's atmosphere. In 1995, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory was launched. SOHO monitors the Sun from a point where the gravity from Earth and from the Sun exert equal force, keeping the probe in a stable orbit. SOHO gives us a clear picture of the solar wind. Its LASCO instrument obscures the central disk of the Sun, revealing the corona, the Sun's atmosphere. The planets are also clearly visible. The horizontal lines flanking them are due to their brightness overwhelming the camera's sensor. SOHO's extreme ultraviolet imaging telescope was able to see waves travelling out from solar flares, causing snow-like interference in the image sensor. Solar radiation in the extreme ultraviolet varies from minute to minute and over the Sun's 11-year solar cycle. Solar activity generates tides in the Earth's atmosphere, which increase with altitude. This, in turn, adds to the drag felt by low-orbiting satellites. Communication systems can also be affected, in particular GPS services. Constantly monitoring the Sun's behaviour is important, and in 2010 NASA launched the Solar Dynamics Observatory. It orbits the Earth geosynchronously at an inclination of 28 degrees, which gives it a constant view of the Sun. The SDO observes in a number of different wavelengths that correspond to different temperatures, each one revealing varying activities, from the surface, to the corona, and to the flaring regions. The Sun is not solid. Rather than rotating, it swirls. At the equator, it spins once every 25 days. At the poles, it takes 38 days. It's in a plasma state, extremely hot matter made up of loose electrons and ions. Plasmas are excellent conductors of electricity, and the movement of the sun generates a tangle of magnetic field lines. The surface of the sun, known as the photosphere, has a temperature of around 6,000 degrees Kelvin and is best viewed in the visible part of the spectrum. Here, sunspots appear as dark regions where magnetic flux impedes convection. These are about the size of the Earth. Beyond the visible spectrum, magnetic loops at the same areas become visible. The lower levels of the Sun's atmosphere, the chromosphere, see gravity yielding to the dynamic thermal and magnetic forces, 
with temperatures increasing to 8,000 degrees Kelvin. Ascending further through the solar atmosphere, a narrow band called the transition region sees temperatures rise to more than 500,000 degrees Kelvin. In the corona, seen here during an eclipse, it rises to a million degrees Kelvin. Why this happens is not understood. The atmosphere is where the solar weather is generated. Solar flares appear as bright flashes, bursts of electromagnetic radiation from radio waves to gamma rays. Solar flares from some other stars are much larger than those from our Sun. And sometimes smaller stars, known as red dwarfs, display extreme solar flares. The SWIFT Gamma Ray Observatory is designed for rapidly locating brief bursts of gamma rays and X-rays. In April 2014, SWIFT saw a solar flare emanating from DGCVN. Its initial blast was 10,000 times stronger than any flare from the Sun. It was the first of seven flares that continued for two weeks. DGCVN is a red dwarf, about one-third the size of the Sun, and it rotates twice as fast as the Sun. This enables it to generate a much stronger magnetic field. It's thought that the strength of the star's magnetic field is related to the intensity of the flares it emits. Coronal mass ejections are different. They are vast clouds of plasma blasted from the Sun's outer layers. They travel with the solar wind. While they are often linked with solar flares, researchers have not been able to establish a direct relationship. Observing the Sun in different wavelengths yields very accurate temperature readings, and the dramatic rise in temperatures moving away from the surface had scientists completely baffled. In 1990, a new One. spacecraft was launched. Ignition and liftoff of Discovery and the Ulysses spacecraft bound for the polar regions of the Sun. The Ulysses probe was bound for the Sun, but had to go the long way. Solar researchers wanted to have a different view of our star. The solar system coalesced from a vast cloud of gas and dust. As it collapsed, it began to spin, forming a disk. All the planets orbit along the plane of this disk, called the ecliptic. Ulysses would look at the poles, the parts of the Sun that could not be seen from our terrestrial viewpoint. Ulysses travelled via Jupiter, using the giant planet's strong gravitation to change its course. It approached on a path that took it over the planet's north pole. This bent the probe's trajectory beneath the ecliptic so that it could see the Sun from a polar orbit. From Ulysses, we learned that the Sun's magnetic field reverses every 11 years, and that the solar wind from the more dynamic south pole was faster than from equatorial regions, yet the south pole had no clear location. The only thing clear about the Sun was that it keeps changing. Five. Now, heliophysicists wanted to be able to see the face of the Sun that was not seen from Earth. Lift off of the Delta II rocket with stereo, giving us a three-dimensional look at the physics of our Sun. The twin stereo probes were launched in 2006. They were in slightly different orbits, one leading the Earth and moving slightly faster, the other trailing the Earth and moving slower. Each year, the two craft separated by 44 degrees, giving each an increasingly different view of the Sun. Because the Sun rotates, sunspots can develop out of sight. As sunspots are key indicators of solar weather, it's important to know just what is about to spin into view. The stereo probes now observe the Sun in 360 degrees. 
This makes it much easier to plot the direction of coronal mass ejections. Though these happen with reasonable frequency, most will miss the Earth. If they hit, they create havoc in electrical systems and trigger substorms in the planet's magnetosphere. Information provided by the stereo satellites is being used for the protection of power grids and satellites through regular space weather bulletins. Since the 1960s, observers have been aware that auroras would sometimes brighten suddenly, with movement within the auroral curtains increasing. These were short-term phenomena, quite distinct from solar storms that result in auroral activity lasting days. As communication satellites in geosynchronous orbits became more sophisticated, they registered sudden localized falls in the Earth's magnetic field that seemed to coincide with what were now being called substorms. Three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff of a Delta II rocket carrying Themis, NASA's revolutionary journey to study the Northern Lights. The Themis constellation of satellites was designed to monitor the behavior of the Earth's magnetosphere. The aim was to measure fluctuations within the Earth's magnetic field and relate any variations to changes detected in the auroras from ground stations in the North American Arctic. Each satellite was equipped with an array of booms to measure the strength and direction of electrical and magnetic fields. After several months, they maneuvered into elliptical orbits of varying eccentricity, with each reaching a high point above the night side of the Earth. The Earth's magnetic field deflects most of the plasma from the Sun. At times of high solar activity, some of the charged particles will spiral into the poles on Earth's day side. On the night side, the field lines are stretched to breaking point, called magnetic reconnection, when the plasma suddenly rebounds along the field lines into the polar regions. In February 2008, two of the probes detected a reconnection event and 96 seconds later, the ground stations registered a sudden brightening of the aurora. The giant loops bursting from the sun's surface are known as flux ropes. They are one of the most basic configurations in plasma. The glowing plasma follows helical magnetic field lines twisting around a central core. The Themis satellites discovered that flux ropes can extend all the way from the Sun to the Earth's upper atmosphere, carrying currents as high as 650,000 amps. Heliophysicists remained baffled by the behavior of the Sun's atmosphere, so a new probe was constructed. Known as IRIS, it was small and simple. It consisted of a telescope, an imaging spectrograph, and ancillary support equipment. It was cheap to build and cheap to launch. Iris was placed in a polar orbit of the Earth that gave it an uninterrupted view of the Sun. It was able to look at the edge of the chromosphere where the plasma began its steep increase in temperature. Its images were far more detailed than had been delivered by any other probe and it could discern rapid changes. The waving jets of plasma, called spicules, were revealed in great clarity. There are roughly 10 million spicules across the Sun's surface at any given moment. They can grow to 10,000 kilometers, yet they collapse in 5 or 10 minutes. Researchers have made computer models of the spicules that behave in the same way as the images from Iris. It is thought that they form through the interaction of charged and neutral particles with the tangled magnetic fields. It seems magnetism must play an important role in the heating of the solar corona and in the high-speed ejection of plasma, but the mechanism is still not understood.
There are at least 20 different satellites currently monitoring the Sun's behavior. Most are in orbit around the Earth. While it is important to get beyond the Earth's atmosphere to analyze the solar wind, it has not been possible to get really close to the Sun. Heliophysicists know the particles of the solar wind change not long after they leave the corona. If these particles could be sampled close to the Sun, it would reveal what part of the solar atmosphere was responsible for their extreme heat and their ultra-high speed. Until recently, it was not possible to build a craft capable of withstanding the temperatures in regions that scientists wish to explore. The team behind the messenger probe to Mercury solved some of these problems with a woven ceramic sun shield which had to face the sun at all times. Around 2010, work began on Solar Probe Plus, designed to pass the sun just 6 million kilometers above its surface. A number of different systems have to work in concert to enable the probe to gather data inside the sun's atmosphere. A carbon composite solar shield surfaced with highly reflective alumina will shade the rest of the craft from temperature extremes. As the sun is a wideband radio source, the probe is out of contact during its close approaches and must function autonomously. In 2017, the probe was renamed the Parker Solar Probe after Eugene Parker, the physicist who had first identified the solar wind. It was the first spacecraft to be named after a living person. On a mission like this into new territory, you're going to be in for some surprises. Maybe not big ones, maybe only little ones, but you're going to find that your point of view will have to change to conform with the data. Why is the solar corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun, uh, at a million or two degrees, when the sun itself is only 5,600? It isn't because of sunshine, that's for sure. Again, we don't know until we make the flight and have a year or two to think about the data. The Parker probe's launch weight is less than 700 kilograms, which is quite modest. Yet its launch vehicle, the Delta IV Heavy, is one of the most powerful boosters available. Minus 15. In the pre-dawn hours of August the 12th, 2018, 10, the final countdown 9, was proceeding. 8, 7, Eugene Parker 6, was at Cape Canaveral to 5, watch the launch. 3, 2, 1, there we go. The probe was headed for 26 highly elliptical solar orbits over seven years. During its mission, it will make seven close passes of Venus, slowing each time to sweep closer and closer to the Sun. After separation from its upper stage, the probe first deployed its solar panels. These fold back near the Sun, with a cooling system enabling them to survive. The magnetometer boom unfolded at the rear of the craft and then the field antennae to measure electric and magnetic fields and waves snapped into place. Though the Parker probe leaves Earth at high speed, it uses Venus's gravity to slow down, allowing it to approach the Sun at the appropriate angle. However, as it falls toward the Sun, it will accelerate to 720,000 km per hour. On its outward loops, it will lose speed, but as the mission progresses, the Parker probe will make closer passes at higher speeds. It made its first close approach of Venus after just 52 days. One month later, Parker approached the Sun. For 11 days, it was out of contact with mission control quietly recording data while carefully keeping its sun shield pointed directly at the sun. Though the heat in this region is extreme, the particle density is not. The sun shield will reach around 1,500 degrees Kelvin 
and the protected electronics of the spacecraft will be at room temperature. As the probe loops away from the sun, it's able to re-establish radio contact and play back the stored data. This is the first image from inside the sun's corona, taken during Parker's first pass. It shows a coronal streamer. The bright spot is the planet Mercury. The dark spots are image correction artefacts. The Parker probe's second and third passes were at much the same distance and speed as the first, but subsequent passes will be both lower and faster as it continues to use Venus to modify its orbit. In 2024, the Parker Solar Probe will visit Venus for the last time, and its final five passes of the Sun will come down to 6.2 million kilometers from the surface. By this time, we should have a clearer understanding of the processes that heat the solar wind and expel it at such high speeds. But whatever we learn about our Sun, it will raise new questions. A clearer understanding of the Sun has led to design changes in satellites and revised management practices of power grids and communication systems. But with new proposals to send humans back to the Moon or on planetary expeditions, we will need to understand more about the potentially hostile solar weather that flows from the star we call our Sun.